Welcome to this Hangout focusing on Cisco UCS Director. In this session, you will have the opportunity to see how Cisco UCS Director reduces data center complexity through centralized automation and management of the industry's leading converged infrastructure solutions, all of which are based on Cisco UCS. But Oops. Let's not. <laughs> Sorry, for some reason the screen share doesn't want to come up. But if we, we kind of describe to you what the positioning looks like, you're probably familiar with Cisco UCS. And at the very basic level, there is UCS Manager. That's designed to be able to manage single UCS systems. And then when you want to geographically disperse those UCS systems, there is um, Central, which allows you to now manage those service profiles across multiple data centers. But most customers today want to go way beyond just managing their compute. They want to be able to manage compute, network, and storage as a unified whole. And so that's exactly where UCS Director comes into play. It allows you to manage in a unified way across your server, your network, and your storage, as well as your virtualization layer, as if it was one single unit. And it does that across physical and virtual, because that's really important in today's data center environments. Now, the other thing that's happening is customers, once they automate their infrastructure, they're saying, I want to go further. And they're now adding cloud. And that's where intelligent automation for cloud comes in. It sits right on top of UCS Director. And it gives you that capability of leveraging the infrastructure for your cloud environments and your platform as a service environments. So as I mentioned at the opening, data centers today have become really complex. Environments, if you think about it, over 75% of an IT's budget is being spent on operations. That leaves a real meager small percent to manage the everything else. And what IT has is told us is they need to get to the everything else. Cisco UCS Director was built from a clean sheet of paper to operationally integrate the data center infrastructure stack, as I mentioned, versus physical and virtual and to address the time-consuming manual processes that are burdening IT organizations today. So Fani, how does UCS Director reduce the complexity of managing this data center environment, especially when it's using converged infrastructure stacks? Hi, Joanne. Uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Fani Benmetza. I am a technical marketing engineer, and I am part of UCS Director product management team. UCS Director uh, provides centralized management, automation, and orchestration from a single unified view. Let me walk you through how UCS Director simplifies the converged infrastructure management and automation. Let me share my screen first. In the next few minutes, I'll walk you through how UCS Director uh, provides a simplified unified management. So UCS Director provides a web browser based a management interface. So here I'm going to log in as an administrator. So this is an admin user. When you click on the login button, it launches you the admin portal of Cisco UCS Director. So here on the top menu, you can see uh, the, the dashboard, converged, virtual, and physical, other top level uh, uh, you know, view menus through which you can manage your converged infrastructures. First, let's have a look at the, the first top level menu dashboard. In, the, in this view, it gives you the capacity information of your converged infrastructure. Here you can see how the you know, UCS servers are consumed, and associated with service profiles. Also, it is giving you how your storage is consumed with the capacity, and uh, from virtual infrastructure point of view as well, how the CPU and memory are you know, consumed. This dashboard is completely customizable. For each and every user, they can add their own favorite reports. Next, we can look at the Converged View tab. Here, we have two converged infrastructures. One is a FlexPod running with Hyper-V, which has a NetApp clustered on-tap storage. 
and then we have you know v block under the v block uh, we have you know emc vnx uh, based storage mds switches nexus switches ucs compute and uh, vmware virtual infrastructure now let's let's you know uh, look at the you know flexbar in, uh, converged infrastructure and we can go inside the uh, netapp cluster on tap controllers here it allows you to manage your netapp storage all right so in a converged infrastructure you have multiple element managers you have netapp uh, you know device manager your next nexus management layer your ucs uh, uh, compute management layer and your virtual infrastructure layer so in this view, the Cisco UCS directory is simplifying the uh, simplifying the management of all of these devices by bringing them together into you know single pane of glass. In this view, it is giving you the you know how the NetApp storage is consumed uh, from aggregate. You know when you look at the aggregates, you know how much how much is the total capacity, how much is consumed, how much is being used, and also you can browse through all of these tabs to view the how the NetApp storage is you know configured. You can see how many controllers are configured in this, you know, clustered on tap controllers, and you can look at the V servers, you know, which are the virtual controllers in the NetApp storage, and you can look at the aggregates, V server piece, and you know, snap mirrors and other tabs and whatnot. UCS Director not only discovers the configuration, it also allows you to, you know, uh, manage and configure the, you know, the storage. So here we are looking at uh, the aggregates tab, where it is showing you how many aggregates are configured. And also it allows you to uh, create new aggregates from this view. You can see the available capacity, used capacity, and total capacity. Now if you look at the V servers, the virtual controllers, it gives you the, you know, the virtual uh, you know, NetApp controller v, v server configuration. You can see how many volumes are configured. You know how many virtual interfaces are configured. If uh, no volumes are configured, you can you know create new volumes uh, you know from this interface. You can look at the you know lunch tab. You can create the lunch you know from this interface. So this briefs about how you can manage NetApp storage controller from you know UCS director. Now let's look at the Nexus, uh, you know, switch management. This is the switch management view, and you can see you know different tabs here. From this view, you can go through how the Nexus switch is being configured. You can look at the interfaces tab, license tab, you know, VTP status, VLANs, where you can see you know all of these configurations, you know, from this UCS director view. If you drop down this menu here, it gives you, you know, what are the operations you can perform uh, on this say, Nexus device. You can create VLAN, you can create, uh, you know, vSANs, you can create SAN zones, SAN zone sets, and whatnot. Next, we can look at the, the configuration tab. So here, UCS director will capture the uh, both running configuration and startup configuration of you know Nexus switch. In the running configuration, you can quickly see how the switch uh, being configured. It not only collects the current active con configuration, it also periodically collects this you know running configuration and uh, you know keeps them as a backup. So which allows the administrator at point in time can go back in the time and see how the switch was configured. You can see the interfaces tab, how many interfaces are there and their status, which interface is up, which interface is down, and you can see the port capabilities, what type of uh, interfaces you have. You can see the VLANs tab, how many VLANs are configured, and you can do the SAN zoning uh, you know, configuration management as well. You can see the fabric login, which shows you, you know, which devices are logged into, in the, into the fabric. And you can browse through all of these tabs, you know, to manage your Nexus switches. Now we can look at the, you know, UCS compute. So here, the UCS director has discovered the complete 
you know, UCSM configuration. And you can, uh, you can see how many chassis you have, you can see how many servers are discovered, how many are associated with service profiles, how many are, you know, powered on, powered off, and whatnot. Also, on the top level, you can see, uh, you know, uh, different tabs. You can, you can uh, go through the, you know, UCS chassis, how they are configured, and you can uh, go through the organizations, you can go through the service profiles and whatnot. So if you drop down, so these are the, you know, tabs which are available. These are the manage, management tabs. You can go through each tab and see the, uh, to look into the UCS configuration. Here we are looking at UCS servers. We can see total how many servers are there, how many uh, powered on, powered off, how many are associated and unassociated. And you can perform all the, you know, life cycle management actions you can see here. You know, you can power on, power off, associate, dissociate, disassociate, you know, you can, you can do the, all the UCS management functions here. And we can look at the organizations, the UCS organizations. You can go inside the organization and you can do all the boot policy management, your, your VHP templates, VNIC templates, your pool management, everything from this view. You can add, edit, delete. And similarly for VHP templates. Similarly for VNIC templates. and the Mac pools. With that, let's look at the virtual infrastructure management. If you go to the VMware vCenter infrastructure management here, Cisco UCS director discovers complete, uh, you know, vCenter infrastructure uh, configuration and gives you the, the capacity information straight away. Here you can see how the you know, capacity being consumed by different you know, virtual infrastructure objects. And you can browse through all of the tabs, like in clusters, how many ESXA clusters are configured, how many ESXA host nodes, host nodes are there, you know, what's their you know, hypervisor version. And the VMs tab gives you how many VMs are there, and it lets you to uh, you know, manage the virtual machines uh, from this interface. So if you drop down, you know, these are the virtual machine lifecycle management operations you can perform uh, from here. From performance monitoring uh, point of view, UCS director provides a very simplified heat map reports. So it provides a color coded representation of how the virtual machines are consuming the you know, CPU, memory, and storage resources. From this single view, administrator can quickly find out what are the VMs are really hogging the, your you know, infrastructure resources. That it be CPU, memory, or storage. So Cisco UCS director not only provides a simplified, unified management, it also provides you know, end to end, end to end you know, automation for your converged infrastructures. So with that, you know, back to you, Joanne. Thank you. Great, so let's dig a little bit deeper. So Mike, tell us how does UCS director allow admins to create those end to end workflows and still maintain an out of the box approach? Thanks, Joanne. Uh, first, first, let me uh, introduce myself as well. So my name is uh, Mike Zimmerman. Uh, I'm also a TME or technical marketing engineer with the UCS Director uh, business unit. Um, so it's a great question, Joanne. So the UCS Director provides uh, an out-of-the-box task library and also a workflow designer uh, that together provide tools necessary for building customized uh, workflow operations uh, for customers. Um, so what we'll do here in the next couple minutes is take a look at a demo of 
uh, leveraging uh, that task library as well as the workflow designer uh, to build a, uh, in this case, a simple demo of, uh, of a two-step uh, operation. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. So we'll kind of pick up from where, uh, where Fani left off here. Uh, you can see we've got our, our flex pod here as well as our V block. Our v -block. Uh, here we're looking at our V block system. Um, so what we're actually going to do is in this example, uh, we're going to create a workflow uh, that adds a VLAN to our UCS manager system uh, as well as one of the Nexus 5Ks. Uh, and then we'll, uh, you can kind of extrapolate from there uh, as far as building an end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, hopefully you'll get a good idea of, of actually how this is, is done through this demo. So if we navigate to policies and orchestration, uh, this brings us to our uh, kind of workflow central page or orchestration page. Um, first off, you can see that there's a, a folder structure here that uh, just provides some organization around the workflows that already exist within the system. Um, so let's go a step further here and take a look at adding a workflow. Uh, first off, we provide a workflow name, so we're going to call this Add VLAN, uh, as well as a, an optional description here. Uh, so as I mentioned before, we're going to add a VLAN to our UCS manager system as well as uh, one of the Nexus switches within that vBlock. Uh, next, we choose a workflow context. Uh, this really uh, sets the context for uh, in which this workflow will be run. In most cases, you're going to choose any here, uh, and what that means is we're going to define the context uh, within the workflow itself. Um, you could also choose selected VM here, which would mean um, you know, we would present the user or the, the user executing this workflow with a list of VMs, and this workflow will be run on that selected VM. Okay. Uh, the save as compound task here. Uh, what this does is saves this workflow, once we create the workflow, it saves it as another task in the task library. So this workflow can actually be referenced um, as another task, maybe in a larger workflow uh, that you might want to build. Uh, and then we can also either choose from a, a, an existing uh, folder that, that is already there or uh, place this workflow in a new folder. So here we're going to create a uh, folder called development. <coughs> So if we hit next here. So this next uh, portion is very important. Um, what we want to do is uh, with any workflow, there may be a certain set of inputs that we want to get from the user that is executing the workflow. So um, as an admin, while we're building these workflows, we can decide where we get um, certain required information from. Uh, what this screen does is allow us to basically set up a form for getting that information from the end user. Uh, so in this case, we're going to create, in our example, we're going to create two uh, prompts uh, for the end user. Uh, the first one we're going to call VLAN ID. Uh, remember, we're, we're in this example, we're adding a VLAN um, uh, to, our, to our stack here. Um, so we provide an input label. Uh, so this is how the variable will be referenced throughout the workflow. We'll see VLAN ID show up, and you'll see that here in the demo. Um, you can provide a description as well as make this variable uh, or this input an, an option. So we can actually provide options to the end user. Uh, one of the important pieces here is the input type. Uh, the input type, and we'll see this a little bit further uh, as we move along within the tasks, uh, the input type defines where you can use this variable. So there's certain um, uh, restrictions with the, with the different tasks um, where the system knows what type of variable it's looking for um, for certain inputs. And, and I'll explain that a little bit further as, as we go along. I think it'll make a little more sense. Uh, so we're going to select our input type here. Um, we've got a nice uh, uh, search box here in the, the upper right. Um, so uh, knowing that I'm looking for VLAN ID, I can search for VLAN ID uh, and choose my VLAN ID type here. And we'll see how that maps into tasks here in just a minute. Okay, so we're going to click Submit here to add that, uh, that input. Okay. And we're going to do the same thing with one more uh, input. We're going to call that VLAN name. 
And so we're going to use this to uh, set uh, a VLAN description on our different devices so that we can be very uh, descriptive. Um, we're also going to choose an input type here. We're going to make this a generic text input so that we can, again, uh, receive text from the, uh, the end user uh, to use as a description for this VLAN. Okay. So now we have our two, uh, our two inputs created. Um, so basically this is our, our form that we will prompt the end user for when they execute this workflow. We're, they're going to get prompted for a VLAN ID and also a VLAN name. Okay. So now we submit our workflow here. Um, so the workflow has been created from a, from a top level, but we still need to add tasks uh, into this workflow and actually create the process. Um, so if we look in our development folder here and we double click on our actual workflow, um, we open up the workflow designer here. Um, so this is one of the tools that I mentioned before. If you look on the left-hand side here, um, this is our workflow library, I'm sorry, our task library. Um, so um, the majority of the engineering work that, that our team does around UCS Director is building uh, these pre-built uh, workflow tasks, uh, which live in the library here. Um, and uh, examples of those tasks might be add VLAN to UCS Manager, might be uh, create a vServer on NetApp Storage, uh, might be create a LUN on VNX storage. So uh, I think we have well over 600 tasks in our task library today. Um, so a very robust task library that can be used, as we'll see here, uh, to build customized workflows. So in our example here, let's look for uh, some VLAN tasks here. And specifically, first, let's look for UCS uh, add VLAN task. Um, so our first step in this process will be to add the VLAN uh, to UCS Manager. So we simply drag and drop that task over when we find it. Um, the first page here, you're basically presented with a wizard that takes you through the process for mapping inputs and outputs. That's really the, the, um, the gist here of building a workflow is finding the, the tasks and the task library that uh, perform the operations that are required. And then it's a matter of mapping inputs and outputs together um, throughout the workflow. Um, so on this first page of the wizard here, we can provide a comment, um, just a little bit more description on, on what we're doing. Uh, and you also see under the task details, you see the uh, output variables. So once this task is run, um, those are the outputs that uh, uh, this task creates and can be used later on in the workflow. And I'll, and, uh, I'll ask you to kind of remember those variables, and I'll show you how those show up in, in um, uh, subsequent tasks. So let's click next here. Uh, the user input mapping page within the wizard um, lists out the um, inputs that are required uh, or that are that can be used within this task. So you see things like VLAN name, account name, VLAN ID. Um, you see common and global as well as fabric A, fabric B. So we can choose to create a, a global VLAN as well as on specific fabrics as well. So what we do in the user input mapping here is um, we can take that form or that information that we get from the end user. Remember, we created a VLAN ID and VLAN name uh, input, and we can map those into this specific task. Okay. Just kind of showing you all the all the uh, input variables here. Um, so let's show how to uh, kind of map those in. So if we select map to input or I'm sorry, it's a user input, we get uh, prompted with a dropdown that shows us those two variables that we created in the form uh, when we instantiated this workflow. So we have VLAN name, VLAN ID. Uh, in this case, we want to use VLAN name. And then we're also going to create a global VLAN here. So we're going to uh, map to user input as well, and we're going to select our VLAN ID variable. Okay. Now, at this point, um, the other uh, inputs that are required, we're not going to map to user inputs. We're actually going to statically assign them as an admin. And so that's what we're going to do on the tasks, uh, task inputs page on the next, uh, the next screen here. So anything that I did not map to a user input, uh, I'm actually going to statically assign within the workflow. So uh, for our account name, we're going to choose our UCS manager that is part of the vBlock system. So it should be the second one here. 
Um, we're going to keep our VLAN type as common global. We could also choose fabric A, fabric B. And then for the sharing, um, this is a standard VLAN that we're creating, um, so those, we're going to keep that as none. Uh, if this was something like a private VLAN, we've got some other options there that you can set. Um, virtual infrastructure here also allows you to get a little bit more granular in creating the VLAN. Uh, so what you can actually do is select certain organizations to, uh, to uh, create this VLAN within. Uh, you can add it to specific service profiles, uh, add it into ser service profile templates, uh, and also VNIC templates as well. Um, for this, uh, this exercise, we're going to keep it very simple and just create it as a, as a global VLAN, um, but just wanted to point out that those options were available. Okay. So if we click Submit here, um, what will happen is uh, this task will be saved with all the, uh, the inputs and mappings that we've created here. Um, and what we'll do next is uh, we'll just drag one more task over for our Nexus switch, and I'll quickly show you how to, how to map that into the, the workflow. So if we search for our uh, network VLAN tasks here, we're going to use create VLAN under Cisco network tasks. And it's a very similar operation here. So we provide a comment. Uh, another note here you see under the task details, you see all the outputs that uh, this task provides that can be used later on in, in other tasks in the workflow. Our user input mapping page, we're going to do a very similar process. We're going to map our VLAN ID input uh, as well as our VLAN name. Uh, and you remember before where I asked you to kind of keep in mind the outputs from the previous task, you notice that our list of uh, options here has grown um, with this second task. And that's because that first task uh, had those four outputs that, uh, that are now available to use in the user input mappings. Um, so you can either use the information you get from an end user, remember that form that we created, or here you can use information that was created uh, as outputs from a previous task. Uh, in this case, we're going to keep it simple. We're just going to use the same VLAN name, um, uh, same VLAN name option here. Uh, if if I wanted to, I could actually map that to the same uh, uh, you know, VLAN ID output there. Uh, from the previous task there, as uh, shown by some of these uh, these longer variables here. Okay. Uh, again, we're going to click Next here uh, on our task inputs. Again, we're selecting, uh, this is where we're statically assigning um, uh, anything that was not a user input. In this case, we're going to choose one of our Nexus 5548s. Um, as the device that the VLAN will be created on uh, for this. We're also going to choose to copy the running configuration, so we're saving that uh, running config to our startup config. Okay. Uh, at this point, it's a matter of connecting the dots between the two tasks. So we're going to drag our uh, success complete to the next task here, uh, con connecting the dots. And then on failure, we're going to take it over to uh, completed failed there. Uh, so we're kind of creating our, our process there, if you will, with the two tasks. Um, at that point, we can click on the Validate Workflow button. Uh, what this does is check all the, um, the required inputs within the tasks, uh, making sure that they're ma uh, mapped appropriately, and making sure there's no issues uh, throughout the workflow. Um, just a, a, a quick point here. Um, this is a very sim simple dem demonstration with two tasks, um, but uh, uh, it's very easy with this drag and drop uh, feature within the workflow designer and the robust task library that we have uh, to, to create a very, uh, 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 a very involved process, a uh, very long operation that would typically take uh, quite a few man, uh, man hours usually to, to pass that information between different teams. Uh, and, and get these operations performed on different devices. Um, so uh, this is kind of a, a quick example of how to build a workflow with our, our workflow tool here. Okay. Great, Mike. So now that we have this custom workflow, how can this capability, is it only admins that can execute these or can other people execute, execute these uh, workflows as well? Good question, Joanne. Um, so let, let me show you a couple different examples here. 
Um, so we've got our, our workflow created that we just worked on. Um, let me show you real quick how to uh, execute that as, a, as a, an admin first, and then we'll switch over from, a, uh, uh, from an end user perspective and show you what that looks like. Um, so a very simple procedure from an admin perspective. I highlight the workflow and click uh, Execute Now. You can see here the form that we created uh, with that workflow. Um, so we uh, require a VLAN ID, so we're going to give it uh, 3001, uh, as well as a VLAN name, so a VLAN description here. I'm just going to call it VLAN uh, underscore 3001 for, for this example. So let's go ahead and kick that off from the admin perspective. Uh, while that's running in the background, and we'll kind of take a look at what that, uh, that looks like in, in just a few moments, uh, let me show you from an admin perspective uh, how we publish this workflow or this capability to an end user. So if we go to policies and catalogs here, uh, we can actually create catalog items that are published uh, uh, operations to uh, end user groups. So you can see our list of catalogs that we already have published. Uh, these are published to all the groups, but you can certainly pick and choose specific groups uh, to publish catalog items to. Um, let's go ahead and add a catalog item. So we're going to provide a catalog name. We'll just keep it simple and call it add VLAN. We'll provide our description here. That's an optional component. For our catalog type, um, the most common here are uh, probably standard and advanced. Standard uh, is a simple, uh, a standard VM provisioning uh, uh, catalog item. Um, what we're going to take a look at is the advanced catalog item, which is publishing um, those workflows or any workflow uh, to an end user. So we're going to take the uh, advanced catalog type. Um, we can choose an icon that will show up to the end user. I typically like to show the workflow icon here uh, if I'm publishing a, a, an actual workflow to the end users. Uh, we're going to choose to apply this to all groups. Uh, again, we optionally could uh, pick and choose specific groups to publish this to. Uh, in this case, we're going to choose all groups. Uh, and then on the, uh, the page here, we're going to select which workflow we actually want to publish. Um, and again, this is uh, essentially extending the capability down to the end user. And we'll see how that, how that looks from the end user perspective uh, going forward here. Okay, so we click Next. We get a brief summary here. So, so now let's, uh, let's log out uh, from the admin view uh, and, and let's take a look from the end user view. So now that we've, uh, we've published that capability uh, to the end user, we're going to log in uh, as the user Mitch Zim here. And first thing you'll notice is the um, the interface itself looks a little bit, uh, a little bit different here. Uh, we've streamlined it uh, for the end user. Uh, and you can see the different capabilities under the catalog tab here. You can see the different capabilities this user uh, can see, or, or basically the admin has published these capabilities to the end user. Um, if uh, the end user double clicks uh, on any one of these capabilities, let's choose the add VLAN uh, workflow that we uh, were just taking a look at. Uh, if I click Next here, uh, again, the, the end user is prompted with the same type of form um, uh, to fill out here. So this end user, let's say, is going to create 3002 as the VLAN, uh, and then uh, description will be VLAN 3002 as well. So we click Next, and you get a summary here. And that's uh, as simple as it gets there. So the end user basically double-clicked. Uh, provide a little bit of information there, uh, and uh, you know is able to kick off uh, a, a workflow now.
So Mike, how, how can I now monitor this, this workflow or this service request? So uh, there's a couple different perspectives, Joanne. Um, first off, let's take a look from the end user perspective. Now that we've uh, kicked off uh, this workflow, uh, and what is actually called a service request, uh, once, uh, once it's uh, instantiated or executed, we call it a service request. Um, from the end user perspective, uh, the end user can go to the services tab. At uh, the top left here. From the services tab, um, this user can view uh, the different uh, workflows or the different service requests uh, for this particular group here. Um, so let's take a look uh, real quick at the uh, service request that we just kicked off for adding a VLAN. If we double click, um, you can see that uh, this workflow is still running. Um, you can see the, the high level steps or the tasks that are involved in this process. Uh, and you can see the current task that uh, uh, the system is working on in order to complete the workflow. Uh, so just to give it another second here, um, everything should turn green here and then we should have a completed workflow. Uh, in just a moment, we'll switch over to the admin view uh, and take a look at, uh, at the admin's uh, kind of approach to monitoring service requests. Um, the admin is provided with quite a bit more, uh, more detail there. So we saw from that perspective the, uh, the service request had completed. And that's the view from the end user perspective. Let's uh, go log back in as the admin. quickly we'll go to uh, organizations and service requests here. And the top two service requests that we'll have here, you'll see our uh, service request that was initiated by the admin as well as the service request that was initiated by our end user. Um, so we can take a look at it either, either one of these. Um, let's just double click uh, and take a little bit deeper look from the admin perspective at this specific workflow. Uh, first off, you can see they're provided with that same high level view but if you notice in the top left corner, there's uh, actually more information that's provided to the admin. Um, they get, first off, a, a detailed log of all the inputs, outputs, uh, what, uh, what functions, what operations are happening on uh, which devices, um, et cetera. So um, all the information that's happening uh, within each of the tasks that are part of that workflow. Okay. Uh, the next tab, uh, Objects Created and Modified, uh, gives you a summary of the different objects that were created, uh, whether it's VLANs, VLAN descriptions, and then on what devices there. So it's more of a summarized page. Uh, the input output tab here, um, very important tab, and, and especially in troubleshooting, uh, gives you all of the inputs uh, values, all of the output values for each task within the workflow. So if you have several tasks in the workflow, this is a very valuable tool uh, to look at how information was passed uh, from one task to another. Okay. Uh, so admins uh, provided with, with quite a bit more uh, information on that, on that service request versus the end user there. Um, and, and basically with those tools you see either from the end user perspective uh, or the admin perspective, uh, both have a different view into, uh, into monitoring a, a specific service request. Back to you, Joanne. Great. So thanks, Mike. We all know that UCS Director uses a different orga orchestration model than what's available in the marketplace today from other solutions. So Shanker, let's bring you into the conversation. And can you explain why model-based orchestration is significant? Thanks, Joanne. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Product Manager in UCS Director, Cisco UCS Director team. Uh, if you look at uh, the normal script-based uh, models, script-based models are mostly the programs written uh, for a specific runtime environment to execute specific kinds of operations. But uh, they lack the understanding of 
uh, the physical and logical relationship that happens between these components and it gives a less flexibility for the admins to go and customize and extend those operations. But if you look at the UCS director model based orchestration, what it's going to do is it's going to go and discover the infrastructure, get the get and create the relationship, physical and as well as logical relationships across each of those components. And not only that, it is stored inside the database of the UCS director where uh, if uh, as Michael was mentioning about the workflows and the tasks, they, those are nothing but they are validated against that specific model to make sure this each task can be executed on each of those components. So it is also used to deliver the status utilization and consumption to the end use, the admins as well as end users. So I can see where a single porter would be really beneficial to centrally manage infrastructure and therefore that reduces complexity. But what if IT is organized by role such as I'm the server guy or I'm the networking person or the storage person? Yes, that's a good question. So today uh, UCS director supports both the centralized as well as the segmented operation models. So let me, uh, so UCS direct has the capabilities to define the user roles and the functions within that particular user role. So let me share uh, my screen to show a small demo of how it, this happens. So what I'm going to show here is how uh, admin can uh, view into a different uh, by default uh, user profiles and the functions uh, which are part of those each user profile. So if you go into administration system and user permissions, you can see that there are a couple of user roles already predefined in UCS director. And if you look at this is one of the all policy admin which covers the entire, it's more like a super admin kind of thing which has a, a privileges for all read and write for each of those particular functions what you see here. Now let's go into the billing admin. So if you look at the billing admin, the billing admin is more focused towards your chargeback uh, and uh, mostly your billing kind of uh, operation. So if you look at here, he will have only the operations, budgeting or resource accounting or chargeback. So uh, th again, this can be updated based on uh, what you want for each of those roles. Now let's look at the, there are three different kinds of uh, uh, user roles defined inside uses that are computing admin, uh, so, uh, network admin and uh, storage admin. In compute admin, he has both privileges for physical computing, read and write, but he will not have uh, access for write access to the physical storage or network. If you look at network admin, he will have read and write access for the physical network, but he will have only read access to the storage and computing. And, and now if you look at the storage admin, he will have read and write access to the storage, but he will not have read and write, uh, write access to the computing and network. So what I'm going to show here is going to create a new uh, user with a role computing admin. So I'm going to click login users, click uh, select the user type as uh, computing admin. Give a name, com comp admin. So what this is computing admin will have only privilege to uh, perform any read and write operations on computing, but not on storage or network. So I added it. Now I'm going to log out and log in as that specific compute admin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into a compute uh, platform here, the, double click that and go into maybe the service profiles and see if I can add service profiles or not. As enabled and I can go and add the service profile into the compute admin. That means I have the privilege for this compute admin. Okay. Uh, Similarly, I can go into the fabric interconnects. I can do any kind of operations into that. Uh, like I double click that and I, I can say configure expand module, uh, uh, expansion module ports and other things. So I can perform all the read and write operations here. 
let's go back to a, a storage component and see if I have access as a computer admin. So one thing in that I have uh, read access, but I don't have any write access, so I cannot create any uh, data modes, or I cannot uh, create any LUNs or volumes. So if I go into the LUNs, I will I'll be able to read it, but I will not be able to create a LUN or volume. So those of us that live in large organizations, we understand that there's tension between our users and IT. And that tension comes from the fact that there's intercorporate billing. And the user sees that bill from IT and they go, what? So how does UCS Director help with that situation, begin to resolve that tension? So uh, UCS Director provides the dashboards, what Fani was explaining before. We also provide the resource limits. We also provide the cost models as well as we also provide some sort of a cloud sense reports. So let me share my screen here. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, different kind of reports or different kind of uh, mo monitoring things which uses that provides. If you look at this is the dashboard watch Fani was showing to uh, understand what is the capacity utilization. It, it, it gets the information uh, about each of those elements and then uh, maps it into this particular dashboard. So again, these dashboards can be customizable. So if you look at this one, it's showing up you the active VMs or inactive VMs uh, as well as other information. Now, let's go and look at the reports. I'm going to call, talk here about how a user can, uh, admin can generate reports find out the inf information about you know, how its infrastructure is performing. So if you look at here, this report shows you the VM uh, count with the CPU utilization, memory utilization, and other things. So you have a different kind of report called virtual uh, infrastructure assets report. It gives you the end-to-end -end, uh, asset information about your virtual infrastructure. So here it says how many active servers or inactive servers, uh, as well as uh, cluster servers, as well as talks about which hardware vendor it is running on um, and other information like ESX uh, versions and all those things. Now let's go to uh, the resource limits what we were talking before. So first and foremost thing is you can set the resource limit for the uh, groups. So you can say, so here I'm, I'm uh, I selected a user group called Acme. I'm going to say, uh, enable the resource limits. So initially it will be disabled, but you can enable the resource limits. You can define uh, how much the resource limit you want to assign for this particular user group. So this particular screen talks about that. Uh, so once it is enabled, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look into the summary and see how it is like I started the resource limits and I want to see how it is performing and the, I'm looking at the status of each. So if you look at the status of most of the resource limits are good, uh, and uh, they're showing up on the right-hand side on the status bar. But if you look at one of them, I just for the demo purpose, I set up it as one CPU gig, one gig, uh, gigahertz limit, and it says reach, uh, limit reach. So that is one of the things which we can definitely monitor. Now look at the, let's look at the budget entry. You want to add a budget to this particular uh, user group. So one thing uh, admin can do is he can define a budget amount per month uh, and then allocate that budget amount to this particular user group. So how it can be done is basically going to the administration, select the uh, user group and say budget policy, enable the budget watch. And so it's, it will start looking at how if it's above or below the budget. And also you can, if you can say that he can go over the budget by selecting both the options. So you can select enable budget watch as well as say allow or budget. Okay, so as we round the, the end here, we know, understand that UCS Director does not live in an island all by itself. It does need to go out and integrate with other solutions. So Shri, let's describe how UCS Director can be extended and integrate into other capabilities in the IT environment. 
Thanks, Joanne. Um, I am Srihari Vengadisubu. I'm a product line manager within the UCS director team as well. Um, as you heard quite a bit from Pani, Mike, as well as from Shankar, UCS director is a powerful software platform. It has got a lot of capabilities, features, and functionality um, that are very important in a lot of ways for data center operations as well as for cloud operations. So how does this environment, this platform, fit into your existing operation? That's where the flexibility of the software platform with respect to how you integrate your existing billing systems or operational systems or ability to customize workflows end-to-end -end, uh, so that your specific needs of your organizations can be met, can be done very easily with customization, as well as the ability to add new custom connectors to a new set of devices that may be coming or perhaps devices that have been in place for a long time. Those are things so that you can We have some technical with. difficulties. Um, so let's just let's just end this by um, by uh, uh, finishing up. And from the perspective of where can you get more information if you want to about UCS Director, and you can do that by going to cisco.com/go/ucsdirector. The other thing that we have available to you, if you'd really like to go even deeper than where we've gone today. There are live technical demos with TMEs, totally live, not, not recorded. You can ask whatever question you want. And you can go and schedule a session, and it's at build price backslash UCS director. There are a series of times and dates that are available, and these live sessions ha happen about every other week. So lastly, um, we thank you very much for your attention and for hanging out with us today. And we hope you've learned a lot. And um, please go learn more about UCS director. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.